Um, hello and welcome everyone to another um, American Physician Scientist Association interactive sessions for the 2023-2024 academic year. Um, we're really pleased to host tonight's session with current physician scientist trainees who are here to answer all of your questions. Tonight's topic will be geared towards finding research, research experience and developing research skills, uh, mostly geared towards undergraduate students, but relative to students at all levels of training. Uh, first, I'd love to have our wonderful, wonderful panelists go around and introduce themselves, um, including their current institutions, research, and specialty interests, and I'll just call on you guys by name so we can be efficient. So, Zoe, would you like to start? Sure. Hi, everyone. So great to be here with you all. My name is Zoe. I'm a first-year student at University of Michigan. Um, my PhD will be in anthropology. I'm largely interested in how pregnant people who use drugs navigate all the institutions that come together to support and treat them and their babies. And clinically, I'm interested in ob -GYN. Thank you. Um, Zachary? Hello, I'm Zach. I did med school and grad school at LSU Shreveport, currently at USF as a urology resident. PhD was in advanced stage prostate cancer, which tailored really well for me going into urology. Cool. David? Hey, everyone. I'm a first year MD PhD here at Virginia Commonwealth University. My PhD is going to be in health policy. So I'm really interested at how different um, healthcare systems and healthcare insurance plans affect access to substance use disorder treatment um, with a harm reduction lens. And Hayden. Hi, everyone. My name is Hayden Hatch. I'm a ninth and final year MD PhD student at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I'm currently applying to residency right now in child neurology, and I'm hoping to continue with the research. Uh, my PhD was um, in the Department of Neuroscience and Genetics here at Einstein, studying intellectual disability using the Drosophila fruit fly. Thank you so much for all of our, to all of our panelists for being here. We're really grateful that you took the time out of your day to join us virtually and provide your wisdom and advice to folks in the early stages of their research careers. Um, for everyone else, uh, my name is Mary Larino, and I'll be the moderator for the evening. I'm a fourth year undergraduate student at Tulane University in New Orleans. And in the chat box, also helping us moderate is Monica, who is a P MD PhD student at the University of Miami. And our lo volunteer live tweeting um, the event will be Kyle, who is a G2 MD PhD student at Vanderbilt. Uh, for anyone who has to step away or miss a piece of the session, we will have it recorded and posted on our YouTube channel after the session. And as the moderator, I will remind you to please submit your questions to the Q&A box. Um, our team of moderators behind the scene will be collecting other questions live. And that's all the announcements I have. Thank you all for being here and we can go ahead and get started. So um, the first question we have is how does one go about finding a lab? Is there a more effective way of finding a research men mentor than rather just emailing a large quantity of professors? Uh, Hayden, could you start us out with this one? Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess every program is different. You do rotations. Um, some programs you do a rotation the summer prior to starting. Uh, some programs you do uh, it during the school year. But I think a good resource is to find students in the department that you're interested in, and especially MD, PhD students. And get their advice on um, interesting labs, not just interesting labs, but labs that have a proven record of mentoring students. And I think the program director um, can point you to um, a couple labs that you could rotate in. Um, it's also good to see if those students have had been successful in getting certain grants, like there's an F30 and an F31 grant, individual grant that you can apply for during your PhD. You can see if, um, if uh, many students that have gone through that lab have been successful in getting those and you can look at the publication records, but I would just start with talking to current students, um, maybe on the student council or in the department that you're you're interested in. Thank you. Um, Zach, do you have anything else to add? Biggest thing I would say is find something you enjoy doing. The path is so long and so hard where there's gonna be nights that you're there late, there's gonna be mornings where you're there super early. But if you enjoy what you're doing and you genuinely can have a passion for it and get excited and find yourself talking fast about it, it'll make the whole PhD process go by so much faster. So that would be my my single most important thing is find something you enjoy and you're passionate about and it'll make everything else easier. Thank you. And uh, Zoe? 
Sure. Um, I also think that it's super possible to get involved as an undergraduate as well. And then you'll have a little bit better of an idea by the time you get to the um, application process, you know, and decide this is why I want to do an MD, PhD. Um, even though I'm in anthropology now, I've actually spent time in both qualitative um, and wet science labs. So I did that both at the undergraduate level. Um, and if that's kind of the place where you all are, you know, you might be a freshman or a sophomore and you're just learning what research is and trying to get your foot in the door. Um, one of them was a class that I just found in the like registration booklet for classes and was able to get involved in a qualitative coding lab um, that they were running. And so I would say scour the course book because you might find unexpected ways to get involved and get a little bit of credit. Um, and another one, I actually did a post back um, at WashU in St. Louis, where I worked in a, a radiation oncology cell bio lab. And I just needed a part time job and they were hiring someone to work in the lab. Um, so I was working with another undergraduate and another post back. But both of those experiences really were foundational, actually, to finding mentorship, both in the, my PhD interests and my medicine interests. Um, and those I just found by I needed course credit and I needed a job. So um, that that's totally something that would be open to you as undergraduates as well when you are trying to kind of suss out, OK, what research interests might I be interested in pursuing later on and want to do an entire Ph.D. about it. And then David, want to finish us off? Yeah, for sure. So I think for me, what's been really helpful is not feeling like I have to stick to a certain topic. I sort of came into the MD PhD program with an idea of what I wanted to study. Um, so how it works here at VCU is we have two lab rotations in the summer before M1, and then another two in between M1 and M2. And for next summer, I'm planning on doing something like completely different from what I initially came into, um, just to test it out and see if there's potential like collaborations or ways of like overlapping interests in ways that I didn't perceive before, or even not like, if I end up not going into that area, I can still um, create, you know, networks of support with other students. So I think one thing that my mentors here at VCU have really encouraged is not having to stick to a certain research area and feeling um, that you have creative license and flexibility with adapting as you go along. And um, yeah. Thank you. All right. Our next question is, when you were an undergraduate student, what were you first looking for when trying to choose a research mentor? Um, Zach, do you want to start us off with this one? Sure. So my biggest thing was looking for a mentor who would allow me to more or less have free reign. For me, it was always an undergrad. I was excited about doing stuff, but I wanted the encouragement to go pursue my own ideas. I was tired of following just what everyone kept assigning me in class or assigning me in the lab part of an undergrad. And I wanted to find, you know, my own path, make my own stamp. So when I was interviewing with, with different labs, trying to figure it out, it was who would let me essentially spark my own interest, spark my own ideas while trying to get their work accomplished at the same time. And ultimately I was able to find one that would do that. And it was, it was an awesome experience because of that reason. Great. Uh, Hayden. Yeah. When I was in undergrad, I, was in, I was in a bunch of different labs because I wasn't sure what I was interested in. So I remember being in a physical chemistry laboratory, um, an ecology laboratory, um, a neuroscience laboratory. And I was just, you know, I, I would spend summers in, in different labs trying to figure out what I was interested in. But I think it's helpful to just, you know, again, talk to students in at the undergrad and, um, you know, just go from lab to lab and see what interests you. Great. Um, David? Yeah, just uh, echoing what Zach was saying. Um, I think in my undergrad, I also looked for mentors that gave me more flexibility with research ideas. So often they started off with like op-eds or just like writing like small um, like LinkedIn, LinkedIn posts or something like that, just to dive into issues that I was interested in. And I was able to like propose some of these research topics to uh, potential research supervisors. And since I already had sort of like a ballpark, of where I wanted to go, they were a lot more willing to work with me and give me more like flexibility with the research project. And that was a really great learning experience. So I think 
going in with mentality of how can I make this research experience unique to my own interests? And like, there will be a mold that the researchers are just used to. If they've um, mentored previous students, they might just use like the same template or approach. And if you can develop that personal relationship with your mentor, I think that's really enriching. Great, and then Zoe. Yeah, I want to echo everything that's been said about, you know, trying out a lot of different areas, like content areas, right? Because you need to figure out what you're really interested in, if you have a passion in this, if you like research, what type of research you like. Um, but something that I ended up finding really important also is personality and chemistry fit with, with mentors, um, especially the ones that you go on to spend a lot of time with and kind of like follow you throughout your career. I have been really fortunate to have super warm, generous mentorship um, through my time in undergrad and beyond. And it was always with the people who took me seriously as an undergrad, saw it as an opportunity for collaboration and that they could maybe learn something from you, you know, not a super condescending kind of environment or where they are thinking of like undergrads as kind of pesky um, or, you know, just people who can mix reagents or whatever, but like really taking you seriously um, and someone that you like and admire, I think, um, are also kind of important things to think about if you're going to be spending a lot of time in someone's lab and working on publications or projects really closely with them. Um, the content is really important because you want, you know, to have relevant research experience to your interests, but also someone that you enjoy and enjoys working with you and you kind of have that personality fit, I find to be really sustainable and fun, um, which has been really important. Great, thank you. Um, another question, kind of going off, Hayden, maybe you could answer this one first. Does the research you started doing in undergraduate have to be the research you do for your PhD, since you mentioned jumping between different labs as an undergrad? Yeah, but not by any means. I think undergrad is a really good time to not only see what you're interested in, but also see what type of mentorship style you prefer. Uh, you know, many different PIs, many different mentors, you know, are, are different. You know, some are very hands-on, some are very hands-off. Um, they're big labs, they're small labs. I think undergrad is a really good opportunity to sort of see not only what research you're interested in, but also to see what environment you thrive in. So, um, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly what you what you'll eventually end up doing in uh, your PhD. And in fact, your PhD or whatever research you do in grad school doesn't really have to do anything with what you do after grad school. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility, and I would just take that opportunity in undergrad to to sort of um, figure out your learning style and uh, what mentorship style you prefer. Great, uh, Zoe. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I have worked in like crazy different environments with really, really different questions um, with a lot of different types of expertise, which I have found, I mean, it makes you really well-rounded and you, nothing is actually irrelevant. Like it's kind of insane, but even if you seem to pivot, you know, a huge pivot, like one that I did from like basic science to qualitative science, you always are going to learn something and be able to take that into your next um your next position or your next project and find really exciting connections, both um, with research questions and maybe theoretical interests, but also with people. Um, so you definitely don't have to, you know, find one thing freshman year and be in a lab all four years and then develop one interest or one question that you're going to go answer for your PhD. I would actually encourage you to like, this is the time to try new things and try something you really, really don't like. And then when the semester is over, abandon it and go find something else that you do like. Um, and it could be completely different. And I think when it comes time for like applications, that is an experience that will be really familiar to people who are interviewing you. And they won't see it, I think, as you being wishy-washy. I mean, unless you're, you've been in like 12 labs and you've switched every week because you don't want, maybe you don't like research. Um, it won't be seen as like wishy-washy. You don't know how to find your question. I mean, undergrad, I didn't know a thing about research when I got here. Um, so it's really a time for exploration. And then they'll say, hey, this person's really well-rounded and they have all these people that really like working with them in these really different environments and they're flexible. So I think it's only um, a benefit to kind of move around and see what you really like and what you're good at. Great. Um, David, do you have anything to add? Yeah, just uh, adding on to what everyone has been saying about moving around. And there's so many benefits to having um, that diversity of research experience when you're just starting out. And for me, 
I put less emphasis on the exact like concepts that I was researching and more emphasis on like the tools that I was gaining. So whether it was like learning how to code or learning how to like structure a research paper or learning how to like collaborate with other people who have like different experiences and approaches for like approaching research. I think it was really helpful for me to explore a lot of different areas and recognize that a lot of these stem from the same foundation. So for me, like in health policy, um, learning how to do like statistical analysis using different softwares was broadly applicable to many different subject areas. So I think I hopped around a lot, but I also um, gained, like, I guess it gained both like breadth in terms of concept areas and like depth in terms of like methodologies. Great. And then Zach. I would say maybe a little side take from this is I would almost encourage you to find one skill in undergrad and master it so that that way you can take that skill and already have a strong set going into your rotations. I was able to do that and I was able to get a paper out of just one of my rotations because of that skill set. And I know four years, five years, eight years all seems like a lot of time when you're in your training. But the, the race now with all these research papers and trying to go to the next step, that residency step, is you want as many as you can. You want to be in the high impact fields. And if you can start to accomplish that early on, it sets a great foundation. So in undergrad, I was able to focus on one technical skill in the lab and it transitioned into grad school almost immediately where I was able to be effective. So I would, you know, almost pivot a little off of you guys, but I, I totally understand where, where everyone's coming from too on that aspect of learning different skills. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, next up, a good question from our chat box. Uh, this student asked, do you think a wet lab is the most traditional research path for an MD-PhD program? I'm currently doing clinical research and I love it, but don't know if I should also pursue wet lab or more hard science lab as well. Um, David, want to start us off? Yeah, I think that there's always benefit to exploring both wet and dry lab research. So I did a um, summer fellowship in a wet lab wet science lab. And although I really enjoyed the process, I enjoyed like creating scientific questions. I think there was this one night where we were all sitting late, we all got pizza and people in my lab were just talking so passionately about that subject and the potential for like therapeutic interventions in that area of wet lab science. And I realized that I just didn't match the same level of passion that they had. Whereas when I experienced public, when I went to public health and health policy, that wasn't even a question for me. Like that was just kind of like an instant fit. So I think there's always value in trying both sides out in your case, clinical lab versus wet science. And I think have like having both sides before you enter your PhD can only be helpful. Great. Uh, Zach, do you want to follow up? Wet lab is definitely beneficial if you want to stand out when it comes to that next step again. For me, the, the wet lab experience is something I enjoy. It's something I always knew I wanted to do later on in life is to have that wet lab experience. Sorry, did I go mute? Um, did you get the beginning of it? Uh, we got a little bit of the beginning. Maybe start over. Okay. Sure. So... The wet lab, I would encourage it if it's something you want to see yourself doing in the future. If you think, okay, when I'm all done with my training, when I'm finally at that point where I've accomplished everything, do I want to run a wet lab? Do I want to partake or collaborate with people that run wet labs? If your answer is yes, that you want to be in some aspect of it, then I would encourage staying on the wet lab side so you get that experience because along your path, it will separate you from all the other students that are just MD students who can do clinical research. I'm not saying don't follow your passions, but if you're looking for that aspect of it later on, I do think it would be encouraging now to have it. Great, uh, Hayden. Yeah, I agree with both both with what um, David and Zachary said. Um, I guess if your question is regarding like, should you do um, ben or wet lab science to get like the upper hand when it comes to applying to MD PhD programs? I don't think it matters. I, I served on the admissions committee here at Einstein for a couple of years, and we saw applications from students who did clinical experiences, some who did wet labs, some who did computational labs, and it didn't really make a difference. Um, as long as you can explain your research um, you know, eloquently, 
um, why it interests you, what the next steps would be, and the impact of your work, I think it should be fine. Um, some MD PhD programs also have a PhD in clinical investigation. We have one of those here at Einstein, and that's basically just doing clinical research. So um, if, that, if that's your concern, then I would say just stick to, you know, what you enjoy doing. If, you know, you're curious about what it's like to do wet lab research, um, it wouldn't hurt to, you know, depending on where you are in college, taking a summer to do wet lab or bench research. Um, I think that would be beneficial, but I would just say continue doing what you enjoy doing. At the end of the day, uh, you have to wake up and go to lab and, um, you know, spend many hours doing your research. So um, just continue doing what you enjoy doing. Thank you. And then Zoe? Yeah, I would echo that. I mean, you said you love clinical research. So I would, you know, if that's something that you really like and you would want to do a PhD involving and further down the line when you see yourself as a researcher and the questions and the type of methodology and interactions that really fire you up about doing this path as clinical based stuff, then I would say totally pursue that. I think back to what Hayden was saying, don't just do it because you feel like you have to, to get a leg up. Um, you know, if like Zach was saying, if you want to be a PI of a wet lab doing 80% time in that very classic MD PhD kind of tilt, um, then sure, make sure that you like it if that's what you think you want to do. But if you've already found something that you really love and you enjoy, that's what's going to shine through during your interview materials, during your, um, the, you know, the application materials and your interviews, they just want to know why you like it, why you're good at it. You're going to be better at things you like to do. And they're going to be more excited to kind of hear about things um, that you loved. And then if you, if you choose to do something in, in a wet lab, just make sure you're doing it for those right reasons. Cause you'll have to talk about that experience too. And it might take away time from doing the types of stuff that you would be able to get a really, really in-depth experience with. So don't do it out of obligation. If you're really curious and want to see what it's like, I really agree a summer might be nice, um, but don't feel like you're at a disadvantage because you don't have that specific type of research if it's not the kind of research you want to do anyway. Thank you, everyone. Um, next up is a question a lot of undergraduates might have. What do I do if I'm struggling to find a lab to start research in? What if I don't have any research experience or skills? Um, Hayden, want to start with that one? Um, I think, you know, they, that could be a, um, I guess it depends where you are in, in undergrad. If you're maybe a freshman and you don't have any skills, then it'd be nice to maybe join a lab that, um, you know, where you have to use different types of methodology to, to, to um, I guess, answer your hypothesis questions, just to sort of dabble around and see what you're interested in. Um, I don't think, if you, I guess if you're a junior or a senior, you don't have research experience, there's always the option of taking a couple years and doing like serving as like a research associate or a research technician and um, honing your your wet lab or, or dry lab skills um, um, to get, you know, the upper hand on the MD PhD application. But if you don't have any research experience and you don't know, know where to start, um, again, I would turn to your colleagues, your, your fellow students who have done research experiences and um, let them talk or explain to you about their experiences and what they liked about their research. Zachary, do you wanna follow up on that? Sure, so it's definitely, I would say it's definitely school dependent. Being at a smaller school where I, where I was at LSU Shreveport, I know people that got in without any research experience. They just were able to talk about a passion for it and a desire to want to do it. And as long as they're able to meet those research rotation requirements, you know, they could stay in the program and pursue it. So I, I would say that if you're trying to go to those top tier schools, it may be more important. But if you're looking more for a smaller town school, a school that is more on a personal basis, like where I was at Shreveport, it's definitely doable that you shouldn't be intimidated by not having that kind of background. It's more of that showing that desire and drive to do it, that you would be just fine. Zoe? Yeah, I came from a really non-academic family. I wasn't fully aware of what a PhD was when I got to college. I really didn't understand how it all worked. So I came in with no experience um, and I went to Michigan for undergrad also. And I would encourage you, you know, depending on where you are, I know Michigan's a really big research school um, and they have a lot of kind of institutionalized formal opportunities. 
but I got involved in an undergraduate research opportunities program where they really kind of hold your hand um, through it. They like get you hooked up with a mentor in whatever kind of lab you wanted to be in. You know, some people went into basic science, some people did like humanities research. It was really kind of an overarching program. Um, so it, it would maybe be worth reaching out to some of your guidance counselors or whoever kind of helps you navigate that type of opportunity at your school to see, hey, are there any you know, programs for people like me, because I think, you know, there are many of us who came in not having a clue, but being like, hey, I think research sounds cool. I want to learn more about it. Um, and so there's, I think, a lot more opportunity for those kinds of programs where they, you know, you don't have to just reach out cold to a PI or kind of see, oh, I don't like that's very intimidating. Um, so I think there's a lot of a lot of programs now that kind of help you um, take those steps in a more formal way so that you have support. So I would encourage to see if, um, if your school has something like that. Great. And David? Yeah, just um, adding on to what everyone else has said, I think that if you don't yet have research, and even if you're in the junior or senior years, there are still plenty of opportunities. You can take a post back, you can do a master's, um, I did a one-year master's and that was really helpful for me because it not only taught me like a lot of fundamental skills in terms of methodology, but it also exposed me to a lot of people who are current doctors and returned to school for their master's or who are medical students and who are just taking a year off to do their master's. So I think it was really interesting for me to talk to a lot of people with a lot of different interests and um really take that time and incubate and think about what I want to do before doing my uh, MD PhD. Great, thank you. And just a brief announcement since we're reaching halfway through the session. Um, this session will be recorded and a team of co-moderators is gathering your questions submitted in real time via the Q&A box. So please ask any questions that you might have or that may come up during this hour. And afterwards, you will you will continue to have access to an FAQ document produced by our MD PhD director panelists, and it will be available on the APSO website. Um, next question. I kind jump of in real quick. Yeah, sure. One other thing on finding a lab, just wander the hallways. Everyone goes to conferences and has these posters made, and they're all proud of them. And then they end up in the hallways. So you guys can always just randomly wander different like buildings and go read the posters that everyone walks by. And you'd be like, wow, that sounds really cool. And then most times you can just walk in the lab and introduce yourself and just say, hey, I saw this poster in the hallway. I'd love to learn a little bit more. And I've seen that happen plenty of times where it's, it's worked out in the student's favor. Yeah, that's a good idea. I know in the science buildings at Tulane, there's posters everywhere. Um, next, going off maybe what David, you were saying, um, does anyone have any suggestions for post -bac students or students in their gap years looking to find full-time lab work? David, you could start with that. Yeah, um, so I didn't do a post -bac. I went straight from my undergrad to my master's, but during my master's, I think one thing that really helped me was realizing that I wasn't limited to my institution. Um, I did like prefer to do research at my institution, but when I was like reading papers, um, like assigned readings for grad school and I came across a paper or like an author that kept on coming up over and over again I would often like e email the author and like not all the time but a good amount of times like to my surprise they actually did reply and offer to set up a meeting even if they didn't have any ongoing projects so I think for me um, just realizing that when you're in your post back or you're in your grad program um, there's so many options for people that you can collaborate with, whether it's a short-term collaboration or long-term collaboration. So definitely um, keep your options open and definitely be proactive with taking that first step if there is someone that you want to meet. Great. Thank you. Zoe, do you have anything to follow up? Sure. Yeah. So I did a post back and then I took another year to apply. Um, so I had a few years out of undergrad and I was actually able to do research the whole time. Um, I'm always, like I said, I always have a job. I'm always a girl with a job. So the the lab work that I did when I first got to Wash U for the post back was also kind of a, you know, I had recently decided to do the MD classes. I was like, I'm just going to do biomedical research and just kind of dive all the way in. Um, and, you know, that was like a $15 an hour, 10 hour a week gig that I did while I was taking classes um, part time for the post back. And it felt really doable and kind of energizing and fun to be doing things in lab while I was learning about it in class. 
Um, and so, and I think they like post back students because you've already got your your undergrad degree. You're maybe a little bit more responsible, and um, I don't know. They, they you end up being a pretty good hire, so they're pretty excited to have you if you decide to do a post back. I would say, um, just because you've got a few more years under your belt. And then during my gap, while I was um, applying and taking the MCAT and all of that, I actually ran the projects of some of my old professors at Michigan that I had gotten to know really well and maintained mentorship ties. And so that's how I funded my life. That was, you know, that was my my gig was was project management. Um, and those were completely because I had great relationships with them. And then when the time came, I was like, hey, do you need a project manager? Um, or they even reached out to me because they we had kept in touch and they knew I was probably looking for work and they had work. So um, it's another kind of plug to work with people you really like in undergrad. It's easier to keep up with them. They're more generous and think of you kind of first because um, you're fun to work with and uh, and they know you and they're probably happy to give you opportunities. Um, so, yeah. I've always found ways to incorporate it um, through those relationships or those types of opportunities. Thank you, uh, Zach. So I didn't do a post back. I don't have too much to say on that regard. I'll just put one little plug in that you don't have to do the MD PhD program to get an MD PhD. I did my PhD right after undergrad and then jumped ship and went to the MD side. So don't feel like if you can't get into the program initially that you are not able to do it. You definitely can do one and the other. And I've known a couple of friends that just started in med school and then hop ship and wanted to do both sides of it as well. That's a good point. Um, Hayden, do you have anything? Yeah, I, um, I, 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 I didn't do like a formal post back program, but I, did, I was a research technician at NYU for about two and a half years. Um, and it, that was really... Um, the first experience where I spent a uh, you know a great deal of time on a single project and I ended up on a paper. Um, it was a small lab. Uh, the the PI was actually a um, a postdoc at Rockefeller and I actually helped him move his entire lab from Rockefeller to NYU, set it up. Um, but he also got me involved in research and I I you know it was a very good experience. Um, so that may be of interest to you. Just going online, uh, many people or many PIs post there. Um, what they're looking for. If they're looking for a technician, it's usually a one to two year commitment. Uh, an important question to ask them if you do find a position like that is if um, if you haven't taken the MCAT, if they could allow some time for you to like take a course or um, do some studying, um, it's really important to establish the expectations, the hours, because it can all, it can get, get pretty busy, especially if you're in the lab and you want to make sure that you have time to prepare your application materials. So Try to find someone who's a supportive mentor, um, whether it be a post back program, a research tech program, or some other form of pipeline program. Thank you. Um, and then the next question, when it comes to applying, what sort of aspects of my research will programs be looking for? Is it required that I have publications or posters? Um, Zoe, do you want to start with this one? Sure. Um, and if there's any social scientists in the in the chat, we should talk more because there's a lot more you have to do for the for the PhD side of things. Oftentimes you have to apply separately completely to your graduate program and do an entire PhD application. So that they want really specific things. So I'll put my email in, um, but I'll keep it more general for this answer. Um, sorry for the long caveat. But I think they want to see that you're a good team member. You can work within a lab or whatever research space that you've worked in well um, and that you like it, but also that you know, you've been able to kind of carve out your own questions and your own interests that you're really excited about and can really speak to. Um, you don't have to have your own publication or be on a publication, I would say, or even a poster. But if you have like a product, like maybe you took three semesters to get your Western blots down and then you finally got them and then you're able to do a project with it. Um, or, you know, I don't have as many uh, concrete examples of that to say, but I would think that you know, being able to really describe what the lab does and what your role is within the project, if it's wet or dry, um, and your excitement around it and kind of having a little bit of ownership is always going to be what's most exciting for them to hear about because they want to imagine you doing that in your PhD here, you know, figuring out your own questions and that you can be an independent kind of thinker um, 
and be creative and things like that. And times that you failed and overcame it, I think are really important. Um, so you don't have to make it glossy. You don't have to just focus on the high points um, of like the bigger papers that the whole lab succeeded on. They really want to hear your individual kind of winding nitty gritty story. Um, so that's what I would say. Great. Thank you, um, David. Yeah, so just echoing what Zoe said, um, it's less, I think, in my opinion, about the exact research that you're doing and more about your ability, as Hayden was mentioning earlier, to like eloquently speak about it and to own your personal story. Um, so last year during grad school, I worked as like an interview coach uh, for med school applicants. And after hearing about like Drosophila and different like biomedical um, research topics over and over again, it sort of just sounds like a blur to you. Um, it also sounds like the same, but I think the ones, the applicants that stood out to me most were the ones who really owned their story, like why they chose to pursue a certain research topic, whether they had a personal connection, a family connection, or they were just really interested in the topic, and that I could clearly see them like continuing to do that research in the future and taking what they learned throughout their undergrad um, and applying it not only to medical school and the MD-PhD program, but to their career as a whole Um as a clinician as a whole. Great, Hayden. Yeah, there really is no need to, or no expectation to have any sort of paper or even a poster when applying to these programs. Um, like the others have said, it's really your ability to communicate um, why you're interested in the project you're, you're doing and um, what the future directions of that project are and the impact of that. And, um, you know, there, there are many people who, who uh, do postdoc programs or lab experiences uh, in their gap years, and they're really only working under a grad student. They're like doing a Western blot. There's no, you know, there's not much thought into the experiments that you're doing. Um, I would, I, I would suggest that you find a lab or you, that, that will allow you to have some sort of independent project that you can make your own, um, where you develop a hypothesis, you test your hypothesis so that when it comes time to interviews, and the interviewer asks you, so like, so what, why, why, why do we care about this research question or um, what would be the next, next steps? You're able to eloquently say what those next steps are and why they're important. So um, those are just my two cents. And then Zach. The only thing I'll add to that is you don't necessarily need a poster or a paper to be competitive, but think of it as a a ticket to allow you to do other things. So a poster is going to get you to go to a conference. A poster is going to get you to go network at the conference. A poster is going to get you to go out there, look around, see what other kind of science is going on. Using all those things can help you pick your career as well as find other mentors. And then being at the undergraduate level, all these societies love undergrads. They want to give you guys money. They want to give you guys travel awards. So being able to apply, and even if you get a $500 travel award, then that goes on the CV. So now you got a poster, you have a travel award on the CV, and you're going to a conference for networking. All those things are what I think should be maximized more than you're saying, oh, I got a poster, so I'm done, and I checked the box. Thank you, everyone. And I would also say, as an undergrad, I know Tulane puts on a lot of um, poster symposiums just for undergrads at Tulane, and they can be a really casual and informal way to share your research. So I definitely maybe look out for those at your campuses or maybe ask your pre-med advisors if there's any opportunities like that. Um, next, a, so a question for the social science PhD students, David and Zoe. Um, can you guys explain a bit more about how your research and application might be different from the traditional basic science applicant and what got you first interested in your work? So Zoe, do you wanna start? Yeah, I could talk all night about this, but I'll keep it short. Um, so there's a lot different and it depends on how non-trad of a social science degree you're going to do. You know, something like epidemiology, a lot more programs will fund it formally through the MSTP versus something like history or anthropology. Then there's a, you're looking at about 17 programs. Um, so you have to do a little bit of legwork in the beginning to see who funds it um, and what would be different. I would say the two main differences are because these graduate programs are not as used to having people come over from the med school um, and because sometimes in their PhD cohorts, they have like four people a year. 
they want to assess you the same way they assess all the other PhD applicants in that department. And so they'll want you to pretty much do an entire PhD application, um, but they might ask for it at the time of secondaries. And so that would be the main thing you want to look out for is you might know that, oh yeah, Harvard's going to ask for a PhD application. Those are usually due in October. I've got so much time, but then boom, you get your secondary and they ask for all of your materials right then and there. Um, and in a lot of ways, like the personal, um, your statement of purpose for that grad app is the most important thing for your, for your application. Cause that's how all this, all the department members are going to assess you. Um, because the med school will probably be like, we don't know who is a good applicant, you tell us, right? Um, they're just not trained in, in assessing you as applicants. Um, so departments will be really friendly to you. Make sure you find an admin person. I also run a website um, nationally to help people apply. So I'll also link that out with my web, uh, with the with my email to talk about it. Um, so that's my, that's more of an anthro thing. I'll be interested, David, to see what you say about some of the other ones. I'm happy to talk about that though, offline too. Um, and in terms of getting interested in this kind of thing, you know, I came to undergrad really, really pre-med and then found anthropology and was immediately like, oh my gosh, this is how I want to know the body. This is how I want to understand why some people get sick and not others and, um, ask more infrastructural questions and, you know, had a really roundabout sort of journey and spent a lot of time in clinics with physicians and realized, oh, I want clinical skills and I want to have this expertise too. Um, so that's a pretty common thing. You fall in love with the, the theory and the methods that social science can give you, um, but you kind of never lose that um, that desire to help people clinically and work with your hands and your mind in that way and be able to make an impact in people's lives. Um, so I'll stop there, but that's 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 kind of, a I think, a pretty common way of, of realizing you want to do both. Thank you, uh, David. Yeah, um, so just adding on to that, to be honest, there wasn't that big of a difference, in my opinion, for the health policy programs, or at least the ones that I applied to. Um, I don't recall them asking any like specific social sciences or humanities questions um, at any of the schools that I applied to, or maybe it was just like a health policy thing. But I think that in terms of um, the schools that I applied to, they did ask me during the interviews a little bit more specifically about the uh, like domains of research that I wanted to work on in terms of um, like what areas of health policy because there were you know far fewer health policy researchers or like dedicated supervisors that were available than some of the wet lab positions. So I felt like I had to um, go a little bit further in demonstrating like fit and compatibility with the school. And for each school, I like specifically chose them for specific areas of research. And some schools, they literally gave me like a spreadsheet of supervisors that were available that year. Um, and only like maybe five out of a hundred were health policy researchers. So I really had to, in my interview, justify why I was a good fit for that school. Um, but that really only came at the interview stage for me. Great, thank you. Um, a more broad question. Have you ever switched mentors because you felt like someone else was a better fit um, personally or for your research interests? Um, Zach, do you wanna start with this one? I have not switched mentors at all because of fit. I got lucky right off the bat because of fit, but I would definitely recommend that you switch if you feel that is necessary. I was taught that you should treat your PhD mentor almost like a marriage. You're going to yell at them. You're going to scream at them. You're going to cry with them. And you're going to be happy with them. But you need to be able to have all those emotions with them to get through that whole roller coaster of a course. And once you find that fit, you should go for it. And if you haven't found it, don't feel bad about looking again to find that fit. Great. Thank you. Um, Hayden? Um, I've, I've been in many different labs, larger labs, smaller labs, labs where... Um, the PI is very hands-on and like looking over your shoulder and others where you don't see them for weeks at a time. And um, I'd say that if, you know, if you have the gut feeling that, you know, a certain lab isn't, you know, good for you, like either for your mental health or you're not getting, you know, the work done because you don't like being in the lab or you're, it doesn't interest you, I would, you know, find, you know, I would first talk, find someone to talk to, maybe a, a prior mentor and sort of, you know, voice, you know, what, you are feeling 
um, so that they can validate it because you're not the only person going through that. And, you know, switching a lab may not, is not the end of the world. Many people do that in grad school or, you know, as a post back. Um, but I would just say, you know, at the end of the day, you have to wake up every day and do, um, you know, do the science and then go home. You, you'll spend long hours in the lab. And if it's the PI or the research project isn't something that interests you or that's helpful, then um, I think that's, you know, that's a problem. And you, I think you should, um, you know, you should seek comfort in, um, in sw considering switching labs so that you can find a mentor that's better for you. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, Zoe? Yeah, I've worked in a lot of different environments too. And you definitely learn about yourself, what you're really interested in and how you really like to work. You know, I hate being micromanaged and I wouldn't be able, I have can, chosen not to continue on in places where I just am not enjoying the management style or, you know, sometimes you just don't get along with the people, right? So definitely you want to make sure that you like what you do. You want to go into lab. You're not bored to tears and trying to find any excuse to like go drink your coffee outside because you just can't stand what you're up to at the bench. Um, and it's a really common experience. I mean, if you talk to anybody um, for the, for an, far enough along in this path, uh, people will switch all the time. They fight with their PI or their a postdoc and the, you know, it's, it's really common. Um, and at the end of the day, these experiences are for you, you know, you're contributing to the lab and you're part of a team, but at the end of the day, it's really serving you and your path and your journey, um, to figuring out what you want to do and you deserve to enjoy it while you, while you figure that out. And David. Yeah. Just, um, drawing back what we said about finding the right lab culture for you. I think it's important to reach out to current students in the lab or prior students um, for a few different reasons. One, if you reach out to them, uh, you can learn more, I guess, of a direct experience from how the lab is being run and the way that the PI um, approaches mentorship. And secondly, sometimes um, you might find a great fit in terms of like research but the PI might be too busy or they might not have enough experience with the MD PhD program. So I've rotated across like a few different labs and I've sort of gravitated towards uh, PIs that have had previous experience with working with MD PhDs um, just because it is sort of an integrated program and um, has its own rules. But um, yeah, I, I think that um, getting that firsthand experience from other students who have worked in that lab has definitely been um, very helpful in my experience. Great, thank you. Um, and this is a question on behalf of busy undergraduate students. How would you guys recommend that someone balance research with their classes? Um, Zach, do you wanna start off with that one? So at my undergrad, I was pretty fortunate that we had classes that we could schedule for research time. So as an upper level undergraduate student, we could take like research blocks. So maximizing those. And then on top of that, just understanding how much can you contribute? What is healthy for you to go ahead and do? There were nights where I was in the lab late. You know, and then I had a poster coming up and was due, but scheduling that appropriately with upcoming tests, understanding my schedule two, three weeks out where I know I got to study this much, but I still have this much time to dedicate to the lab. And just understanding where your goals are. Are you okay being a 3.7 student or a 3.2 student while trying to do more research? Or are you like, I have to get the 4.0 and then you put the research to the side. It's really just what what would make you feel most comfortable with your application going forward is how I would I would frame that. Uh, David? Yeah, for me, I think it was just being clear with the priorities um, that I had. So for me, I liked doing research when there were um, like semesters that were a little bit easier, or a little bit lighter. Sometimes I would plan my courses in a way that like I had lighter electives one semester to give me a little bit more bandwidth to do research and clubs and that stuff. Um, but you shouldn't let it sort of overwhelm you just for the sake of getting publications or posters. Um, as we mentioned before, there's so many options of getting that experience in terms of doing a post back or getting, you know, working as a lab um, admin or um, pursuing a master's program. So there's so many opportunities of getting that research and don't feel like you have to sacrifice your physical health or your mental health um, to cram it all in. There's really no like 
template or expectation from um, like medical schools for that. Um, Hayden? Yeah, totally agree with all that. Um, I think undergrad is the perfect time to sort of hone your time management skills and understand what methods um, work. Um, I remember there was a semester in college where I thought it was a good idea to be a student in two labs at the same time while also managing coursework. And that did not end well. And I got some stern emails from um, some of the professors like saying, why aren't you taking care of these mice? You know, they're just sitting on the floor like, um, but yeah, it's, it's all a learning exper experience and, um, you know, just handle what you, you know you can handle. Like Zachary said, there are, um, at some schools you can have a research block or a, re a reading elective as a class. And so that's, instead of doing a class, you can be doing research during that and have a lighter course load. So um, just look into what your school can offer you and don't feel like you need to overburden yourself with all these classes and research experiences. If anything, it's better to have um, one research experience that you're dedicated to that you put, you know, that you're very passionate about and that you can talk um, about at length during an interview. Great, thank you. Um, we have one last question for our panelists. What are the best traits of an, of an effective researcher? Zoe, do you wanna start with this one? Yeah. This is kind of a hard one. I think that effective researchers are curious. I think they're they also have a lot of humility. I think um, you know, being able to be excited about a new problem, but knowing what you don't know and being willing to collaborate is always really, really important. Um, I think that you can kind of bravery or courage seems a little bit strong, but like, don't be afraid to ask what hasn't been asked or, you know, put two things that seem like they don't fit together and see what the connections are. I think that creativity and excitement about that process um, will get you a long ways. You know, in anthropology, we think a lot about imagination, actually. So like having a really expansive imagination about what's possible. Um, but I also think humility and kind of generosity in in your research process is, um, is also really important. People like brilliant people, but they also like nice people. Um, and they like, uh, collaboration. I think right now is, um, I, it's probably always been really hot, but interdisciplinary work and being able to work on a team is really important. Um, so those skills, I think really come into play in ways, you know, you want to be fun to talk to at a conference with your poster and, and be able to collaborate with other labs and things like that. So being well-rounded, but also really curious and imaginative. Great, thanks. Uh, David? Yeah, just uh, echoing what Zoe said, I think that humility is so important. Um, no matter how like how many skills you learn during your undergrad or your PhD, it's never going to fully encapsulate everything that you need to know to make um, like a widespread contribution in your field. So be willing to collaborate with other researchers, other medical students, other doctors, um, and other community members sort of go into that mentality or go into those collaborations with the mentality that you always have something to learn because your on the ground experience might not be the same as theirs. And this can also influence the way you, um, approach your own questions, especially from people sort of outside of the traditional sphere of academia, um, especially when collaborating with the community members. I have learned so much about the way that I approach um, research and the interactions I have with um, research participants. So yeah, definitely be willing to um, collaborate with multiple different spheres. Great, uh, Zach. So, so this might be a little controversial because we just talked about time management and having a good balance. But the best, the best advice I've lived by and I've done and that I'm going to screw something up. I'm going to get one wrong. I'm going to screw up this Western because there's a million ways to do that. But at least I'm still going to get one of these four experiments to work that day where I keep pushing forward. And by doing that, you're able to stay on topic so much faster than doing one experiment at a time or doing one thing at a time and bypass when you get those lulls or you're like, man, this week just isn't going well. You're still always going forward. So failing fast, don't be ashamed of it. We all have it. My failures are 10 times higher than my successes. But that is what's got me through everything to where I am today. 
Great, thank you. And lastly, Hayden. I don't have much to add to any of that. I, I agree wholeheartedly with what everyone has said. No, that's great. Thank you, everyone. Um, so that was our final question, but I just want to thank everyone for joining our Q&A session today with our current students. I want to extend a big thank you to our panelists for their time, their participants who made this inter who made this session so interactive, and to all of the people in APSA, including the APSA Diversity um, Committee, PR Partnerships Committee, and APSA Leadership that put these sessions together and worked to make sure the UIM applicants received word of it as well. Our next interactive interactive session is scheduled for December 14th. Um, we'll send a um, registration link for this session shortly, and you can always check our website, social media, um, and look out for further emails to register for upcoming events. The event on December 14th will be a session for applicants about MDDO PhD interview tips and advice. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining, and thank you again to our panelists. I hope everyone has a great evening.